Hello and welcome to the Majlis, the podcast by Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, focusing on Central Asia. I am Mohammed Tahir, your host here in Washington, D.C. Tajikistan is the smallest and poorest country in Central Asia and geographically landlocked, economically dependent on remittances sent by millions of Tajik migrant workers in Russia. On the top of these challenges, the country is also faced with an acute leadership crisis where its authoritarian leader is more focused on strengthening his grip on power than seeking solution to unfolding crises. In the face of such a difficult environment, one person is fortunate thriving more than ever, and that is Shamsullah Sahibov, presidential son-in-law who owns a rapidly expanding company called Farus. This is the conclusion of the recent report published by an NGO called Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And today on the Majlis, we are delighted to have two of the authors of the report and to discuss the document and its findings. Ilya Lozowski, the managing editor, and Miranda Patrutsic, Central Asia regional editor of the project. And as usual, my colleague Bruce Panier is also tuning in from Prague, who is the editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty Central Asia blog called Kishlak Owazi. So, Oh, thank you, colleagues, for uh, taking the time and joining us. Thank, thank you, very you. Very nice to have you. So, Ilya, first, let me uh, commend you with this in-depth report. It was, uh, it was quite a read. Thank you very much. It was a whole lot of work. Lots of reporting there. So the report has, uh, Ilya, four sections. Uh, we will touch all of them in details, but uh, I guess all of those sections meet at the uh, intersection of corruption and rule of the presidential family in it. So why not to start with the big picture, Ilya? How deep is this connection between the presidential family and a business in Tajikistan? Well, if you want to zoom out, I guess you could say that in general, uh, there is very little major business in Tajikistan that's not touched by the presidential family. This is sort of how the system works. Whenever your business rises above a certain level, hmm. it can get noticed by anyone related to the family. The case we focused on here is Shamsulo Sahibov, the president's son-in-law, but it really could be anyone. Many of the president's children or other relatives control large businesses in Tajikistan. So that's one reason the country's economy is doing so poorly and one reason we wanted to focus on this because it results in really tragic consequences for the country's human development. Uh, definitely we will talk about Sakhivov, but other than Sakhivov, who's active in this, in, this, in this circle? I think one of the stories, I'm not remembering off the top of my head right now, but basically all of the children, uh, the president has seven, I believe six or seven daughters, yeah. Yeah. and they have various positions. One of them at one point was head of the presidential administration. One of the sons, I think, is being groomed for the president to take over the presidency after the president eventually someday is no longer in power. Hmm. Uh, so really it's... It's, you know, dozens of people, it's cousins, it's brothers, it's children of both genders, it's um, sort of a whole big network. Um, so that's one reason we kind of, it's hard to grasp it all, and Tajikistan is a very complex country to report from, the business records aren't readily available, so that's why we, in this case, focused on one case that we could sort of pin down. Hmm. And Radio for Europe actually has done really impressive reporting on some of the other son-in-laws and uh, their businesses. And, uh, you know, for us, we try to report on our own and discuss our own stories and our own findings. Mm -hmm. And we really looked into in detail in the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our first uh, big investigation in Tajikistan. It was a, a very new country for us right. until this project. So we haven't really looked in depth into other businesses and other family members. Just to give a few examples, I can name some of the other names we've hmm. come across. Rustam is a son of the president who used to head the country's anti-corruption agency, which is an obvious conflict of interest. Hmm. He was appointed mayor of Dushanbe, the country's capital, at the age of 29. Uh, he's the one who's being groomed for the presidency now. Ozoda is the daughter I mentioned who was the chief of staff and is now a legislator. There's a brother-in-law, Hassan Asadul Ozoda, who hmm. is the head of the big, largest commercial bank. And, of course, Sahib of the son-in-law. He's really the one we focused on and um, probably the one we know the most about. Hmm. You know, I see there's a clearly a conflict of interest here, given the positions that they hold. Miranda, maybe you could jump in here. So how their involvement of the presidential family, the sons and daughters, looks like in practice with those businesses? Well, there were a couple things we heard. One of them is that if a son-in-law would like to take over the business, hmm. they basically just go and ask and get it. Hmm. I think that's the easiest way. Other ways is that 
the state inspection services are used to put pressure on the businesses. And then, of course, you have a president who is passing on different orders which benefit his own family. And I think this is one of the things we've also seen with the foreign investments. I mean, the story that we reported about a gold mining company, we've seen that in their annual reports, they've been stating that they're waiting for the decision on the presidential level, huh. that um, their, their license is, in, is pending, that they're not sure whether they're going to get it. And once they've made the payment, the license just happened. And it, 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 the decision was ultimately approved by the president himself. Huh. So we can see that in many other countries, uh, you have different levels of the government who are who are in charge of different aspects of the business. In Tajikistan, it appears that a lot of uh, these aspects are centralized hmm. and ultimately controlled by the president himself, which means that instead of having many mechanisms to obtain certain things, you basically depend on a single person or a very small number of people for anything that you want to do in the country. Interesting. But let's talk a little bit about the young guy. Uh, while reading your report, you often confront with this man, Sahibov, who appears to be so talented that his company is moving ahead in full speed, expanding into every existing industry there. So uh, tell us, please, a little bit about this guy, this man, Sahibov. Well, the interesting thing about him is that he didn't start out as a very prominent person. When he was one of our stories called A Murder in Istanbul sort of tells about the fate of another man named uh, Umar Ali Kuvatov, who was Sahibov's business partner. So this whole story ended very tragically for Kuvatov. He ended up being murdered in Istanbul. But he's actually the one who brought Sahibov, in a way, brought him to prominence in the first place. We talked to Kuvatov's widow and some other members of his family who described Sahibov as initially sort of a provincial young man who wasn't very uh, knowledgeable about the world, who didn't speak Russian very well, who didn't really know, wasn't really in this whole world. And Kuvatov sort of became his mentor and business partner. And together they built a business. And through their partnership, they became close friends. Kuvatov's widow told us, you know, Sahibov used to dine at Kuvatov's house frequently, and he would sort of teach him and mentor him. Mm. And eventually it was with Kuvatov's recommendation and with his help that Sahibov ended up marrying into the presidential family. And um, at least that's what Kuvatov's widow says. And he that's when he became to grow in prominence, obviously. Now he's married to the president's daughter, and he grows in stature. He ends up representing the country in London as a trade representative, I believe. And at the same time, he and Kuvatov continue building the business, but he starts threatening Kuvatov to basically leave. To bas- He's basically pushing him out. And some private phone conversations that Kuvatov recorded were published on YouTube, and so this sort of came out. There was a big falling out between the two men because Sahibov was essentially pushing him out. And this is where their fates really diverge, and Kuvatov mm-hmm. becomes an outspoken opponent of the regime. He ends up fleeing the country and founding an opposition group based in uh, Russia. Uh, and eventually he, he's arrested several times in various countries on the order of the Tajik government, and eventually he's killed in Istanbul. Meanwhile, back in Tajikistan, Sahibov now still is married into the presidential family. He's got this business that now he controls 100% that he's taken over from Kuvatov. And now this is another one of our stories called When the Country is a Business. That mm-hmm. basically goes into some of the different areas that his company, Faroz, is active in and how in each of the cases it wasn't just you know a brilliant young businessman building a company that becomes an empire. It's a story of how his family, the president's family uses the apparatus of the state to clear the field and to ensure that this company in every sphere that it enters basically wins against all of its competitors and becomes dominant. So this is just such a clear example of how personal power and state power is conflated in Tajikistan to the extent that once you're in the presidential family, all the levers that you can think of of state administration will be pulled in your favor. And you'll come out extremely rich, even as your country is extremely poor. Mm. Very interesting, Bruce. So what do we know about Sahibov in the, the entire conflict of business interest that we are talking about in Tajikistan? Well, I mean, Ilya just did a good job of, of uh, running down uh, his his meteoric rise to being undoubtedly one of the richest people in Tajikistan mm. today. You know, I mean, there's obviously, as, as we heard, uh, 
family connections are everything in Tajikistan. Mm. You know, and it, it's it's been kind of interesting and sad to watch the changes in, in Tajikistan because, of course, you know, when Rahman's kids, I think Azad is the oldest. And she's about 41, mm. something like that. But um, for years, of course, they didn't really play much of a role because they were they were still children. Uh, 1990s, the Civil War, you know, the Civil War ends. Uh, you don't really hear too much about them. But but really, I mean, it was a major shift when they started to come of age all of a sudden. Uh, and, and he started, you know, the president started to think about how they were going to work in with his schemes for the future. And, you know, so you really see, you know, as of about 10, a little more than 10 years uh-huh. ago, um, this shift all of a sudden um, where things had been kind of chugging along there for a while um but then once the children start to grow up then then you get uh you know as we heard uh they start taking a position not only in government but but in the business world and and uh, the people they marry certainly the daughters uh, their their husbands all end up being you know moving up the ladder and even rahman's brother-in-law and of course there was you know years ago there was the big falling out between supposedly between him and Rustam Mumali the son and and uh, he got shot i think and they covered that up pretty good but uh, you know it it's just been like i said it was kind of sad to see that although things weren't going well hmm. they were kind of going forward uh but but once the kids grew up then everything started to change and and for the worse I was also curious about the the focus of this young guy in terms of companies that he's acquiring or the the investment that he's putting in. What seems to be his major focus in this? I think it's very hard to say what his focus is. I think he's very opportunistic. Hmm. And I think he's been acquiring uh, companies or, you know, investing or setting up businesses where opportunity would present itself. And, you know, one of the examples is, for example, small Farula business, which seems quite insignificant from the outside, but it turned from a small income for, for local people, it turned into, you know, a government band and president st- stating that, you know, only company with the facility for production could actually pick Farula. Just to clarify, that's a, that's a plant that's, co- pe- people might not know, that's a plant that's harvested in the, in the region uh, by poor farmers, just kind of a... Uh, to earn a living and this is actually a great example that Miranda is bringing up because it just shows that any sector they can find any advantage in they'll jump into and they actually Sahibov and back then still his partner Kuvatov they started their business selling oil to NATO in Afghanistan that was sort of how one of the beginnings of Faroz and it's still involved in that business but as Miranda was just saying these medicinal plants that are now being uh processed in Tajikistan and you know you, you just look at the categories in our report driving schools the country's only winter sports facilities customs terminals we mentioned medicinal plants mining banking I mean it's kind of hmm. a grab bag Bruce is it surprising what does it tell you you know it's surprising to the lengths that it's it's reached I would I would say but I mean if you look at any of the neighboring countries of course they all have this problem uh, and have had, uh, you know, uh, Uzbekistan and Golnara Karimova and uh, Dariga Nazarbayeva and, and her sisters in Kazakhstan and, um, you know, e- even Maxim Bakiev, for instance, or, or Arakayev's children, for that fact. You know, and, and now, of course, in Turkmenistan, we got um, Serdar Berdi Mukhamedov, who's being groomed to replace his father, although he doesn't seem to be have to have the business interest that the children in the other Central Asian countries but, but his all sisters, seem to have acquired. his sisters do, I heard. Well, Berdy Mukhamedov's sisters, yeah. yes, that's true. Uh, his son, no. But his sisters, absolutely, they are them. And, and, and it's, it's almost the same kind of model where uh, their husbands, either they uh-huh. or their husbands are controlling, you know, hmm. most of the key businesses in the country, you know, and, and all the way down again, you know, to, to cigarette imports, for instance, you know, and things like that. So there, there was models out there for the Rahman family to follow without a doubt. But but um, they've taken it a lot further, I think, than in the other countries. Going back to Kazakhstan, for instance, you know, while it's true that, that the Nazarbayev daughters are all doing very well and their husbands are all doing very well, they make a, every effort in the world to, to try to keep it really quiet, as opposed to someone like Gunara mm-hmm. Karimova, of course, who, who really wanted the limelight and to show uh, what she had, you know, and, and with the homes in Switzerland and France and, mm-hmm. and everywhere like that. Now, Tajikistan's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's because they get less attention or possibly maybe that that no one uh-huh. cares in Tajikistan anymore. They it's known that the Rahman children all are involved in this and their spouses if in the case of the the daughters 
but it doesn't seem to get the outcry that, that it has in some of these other countries. You would think that after the fall of Maxim Bakiyev, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan, who's who been sentenced in absentia and they're still trying to get him you know, extradited back home, that, mm-hmm. that people would be a little more cautious. But it shows that <laughs> banditry is just running wild in some cases in Tajikistan because they just don't seem to care. Yeah, in terms of the uh, Sahibu's success, the presidential connection, I believe, is is vital. And also, some people would say the other contributing factor in his success or expansion of his business is also attached to lack of uh, opposition in the country. What's truth in this one? Uh, well, actually, that's one reason that, with, along with the report, the sections of our report that focus mm-hmm. on corruption, we also wanted to include a bit more background and context about the political situation. Because mm-hmm. when you hear about you know, a country being ruled by a family basically for its own personal enrichment like this, you start to wonder, well, Mm. why don't people rise up? You know, why isn't there protest? Why can't the government Mm. be brought down? And of course, the answer is that any real opposition that has ever existed has been uh, brutally suppressed. And an interesting thing is that even though that so that's why we included the fourth part of our report, which talks about that, it's called the death of Tajikistan's Islamic Renaissance. And it focuses on party called the uh, Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan. The interesting thing is that even though Tajikistan is so underdeveloped, even back in the Soviet era, poor and relatively lower levels of education, you wouldn't think it would be a very ripe ground for sort of grassroots political organizing. Hmm. But in fact, it had one of the most effective opposition parties in the whole region. Uh, This party was rooted because it wasn't sort of an elite liberal party that some liberal people in the cities are supporting. This was a real grassroots Islamic party that arose in the way back in the Soviet underground. And at its height, it had 50,000 members in the early 2000s. After the civil war ended, the peace agreement basically allowed President Rahman to secure the country, but it forced him to accept 30 percent of government posts should go to the opposition, which included many members of this party. And for years, it was tolerated. And it wasn't just based in the capital. You know, they had cells in every region, in distant villages. They were accessible to people. They brought in international experts to teach people about things like rule of law and pluralistic Mm -hmm. governance and all these kinds of things that you wouldn't hear from the government. They had two symbolic posts in uh, parliament that was sort of allowed to them, even though by all rights they should have won more, but of course the elections weren't really fair. So for a long time they were tolerated until 2015 when they came out in opposition to some proposed constitutional changes. You know, there was an economic crisis, so the government was already cracking down on religious observance, forcibly shaving men's beards and telling women not to wear hijabs. And then the party was just crushed in a matter of months through a variety of methods that we describe in our article. But they were, you know, activists were scattered across the world, tortured, imprisoned. And so basically they were stamped out just in a few months. So that's sort of our story about why this kind of brazen, you know, kleptocracy doesn't result in more opposition because they've basically been suppressed completely. Hmm. Hmm. But there's also another aspect, which is there is a huge cult of personality, not just in Tajikistan, but also all over Central Asia, where the ruler is seen almost as a godlike figure. The whole PR mechanism works in a way that people see the president as a good person, hmm. as you know somebody who's taking care of their interests. And then whenever something doesn't work well, it's basically a minister or small level government official. And the president is the one who's going to do everything he can, but he can't fix everything because it's too much work. So I think that's one part. And then the other part is that you have education level. I mean, in the countries where you have poverty and you have a small percentage of uh, educated people, of course, they don't, you know, read independent sources of information. You know, they're trying to provide for their own livelihood and they really rely on what, you know, government tells them or what authorities tell them to mm-hmm. believe. Mm-hmm. There is no critical thinking, really. Yeah. There's a great anecdote that we heard during our reporting when a researcher, I think uh, this was Edward Lemon, and then was in Tajikistan. And this was a time when Umar Ali Kuvatov, the man we mentioned earlier, who had fled as a critic and was doing opposition politics from Russia, he was paying a Kazakh TV channel to sort of broadcast his message, and some of it actually got into Tajikistan. And the cleaning lady was there, and she happened to see this him on TV criticizing the president, which would have been one of the very rare occasions she would have seen anything like this. And she was just stunned. You know, her mouth fell open, and because this was like for the first time in her life, somebody was criticizing God on television. This just speaks to the cult of personality that Miranda was talking about. That's built there. I mean, 
I think comparing it to North Korea would probably be a step too far, but it's definitely, you know, along those lines where you really do not hear any criticism and it's shocking if you ever do. Hmm. Uh, Omar Ali Kuatov, the man who was later uh, killed in Istanbul, right? Yeah. Bruce, is, is there any connection do you see between his criticism of the authorities and his death? I, I think it would be hard not to see, uh, make a connection mm-hmm. between these two things. You know, I mean, it, this is one of those examples where the government really makes its own enemies. Yeah. He was a successful businessman. Mm. He was fitting in with the government. I mean, yeah. he wasn't opposing the government as long as he was able to conduct his business. Now, when Sahibov took the business from him, yeah. and it was obvious that uh, he was about to fall on even hard times, he left the country. And I can remember when, when he was outside the country and called for this mass demonstration in Tajikistan. And really, up until that, no one had ever heard of Group 24. I mean, the mm. government's response, which was far beyond what they needed to do, actually made the group famous because they put this this huge clamp down. You know, I, I, it's in the report, too. But I remember that they they shut off mobile phone service and uh, it all kind all kinds of stuff. So military presence outside the airport and in big buildings downtown in Dushan Bay, everything to keep anybody from trying to demonstrate. And it was like the best commercial they could have ran for this group who no one really had heard of yeah. at the time. Hmm. I'm not sure how many people are in Group 24, and I know that they, they've developed a platform and they're still out there working, yeah. um, but I, I wouldn't compare them with the IRPT, for instance. Uh, yeah. You know, um, you were we were talking about them a minute ago, and I thought one of the things I should mention here is that, you know, over the years I've been covering Central Asia, I've talked to a lot of opposition, quote-unquote opposition people uh, from all the countries in Central yeah. Asia. And when I was in Tajikistan in 2006, it was it was really interesting to come across, to, to meet with these guys all over the place. Uh, from the Islamic Renaissance Party because they really did have a developed platform. They had a party program. Uh, if you talk to a lot of the people, certainly in the 1990s, that mm-hmm. were supposed to be the big opposition figures, and you said, well, what do you think you should do about the government? I mean, what, what what's your plan? They said, well, we got to get rid of the guy in power and, you know, and, and put somebody else in there. And I'm like, okay, well, what's your health care plan? Mm-hmm. Well, we don't know about that yet. What's your taxation plan? Well, we don't know about that yet. Mm-hmm. You know, so their, their opposition basically boiled down to, we want him out and I want to be in. Whereas the IRPT had this whole thing about mm. housing programs, medical care. It was very refreshing. Kyrgyzstan, of course, is an exception. Mm. You know, all the parties there have something of this and all and have for a long mm. time. But but uh, after Kyrgyzstan, you know, in the other countries, you really didn't get that very much. Thank you, Bruce. So the report also suggests that, in talking about the environment in Tajikistan, that this is exactly how the modern uh, kleptocracy looks like. But what makes Tajikistan unique when compared with the other actors in the region and where is this environment leading the country we will continue majlis discussing these in many other questions shortly First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis Ready for Your Pridal Liberty Central Asia podcast, in the light of a recent investigative report by Organized uh, Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, we are discussing the murky business dealings in Tajikistan and its connection to the presidential family. Joining me in the discussion are Ilya Lozowski, the managing editor of the project, Miranda Patrutsic, uh, the project is Central Asia uh, regional editor, uh, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Ready for Your Pridal Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlo. Awazi. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis here in Washington, D.C. Welcome back, uh, colleagues. So, Elia, to start with you, uh, you, you guys are just incredible. Since the Tajik report, you uh, also put out another bombshell discussing uh, how corrupt officials from uh, around the world are using uh, Dubai as a, a safe haven to hide their money. Is there anyone from Tajikistan in the list? That's a good question. Actually, I'm not sure. There's a lot of names that we are, we're only sort of publishing the highlights of the names we've found mm. because we don't want to do sort of a irresponsible data dump where we just dump the names yeah. because we have to verify that the people are actually connected to the properties. We have to try to reach out to them. Of the names I've seen, I have not seen uh, any Tajik names on there. There are many Central Asian names that we are still looking into hmm. because the problem with the data was that uh, in some cases all we would get is a name and hmm. uh, you know, often in Central Asia without a patronymic, you can't really establish somebody's identity. We don't know everybody. Yeah. So when we see through the date, of course, our first choice are people that we recognize from the previous work. Hmm. And then we are leaving the uh, less n- familiar names for the later. And then, unfortunately, a lot of these names didn't have uh, a country affiliation. So we couldn't like say, OK, who are all the Tajik 
you know, mm. citizens. We would just get a number of names that sound Tajik or sound Uzbek, but then we need to really find out if they are from Uzbekistan or Tajikistan mm. or any other country. There was one Central Asian name I remember was somebody involved in the Brother Circle uh, criminal organization who, I'm not sure which Central Asian country he was from. That's Uzbekistan. Okay, okay. so he was uh, connected to some property there. But, you know, we've seen this pattern before in other investigations, too. We did a big Kazakhstan investigation earlier where we showed how that country's oil minister was building vast offshore structures. In that case, it wasn't Dubai, it was uh, Bermuda to, you know, he built a business empire. Also, there's kind of stretches across the world. One thing we always try to point out in our reporting is not it's not just a Central Asia story. It's not just a Tajikistan story. It's not even just a Dubai story. These are cross-border stories that show how kleptocrats from this part of the world can take advantage of the Western financial system mm. that we all rely on, that our civilization relies on, mm. to launder their dirty money. You know, they don't want to keep their money at home where it can be taken from them just like they took it from someone else. So they want to park it in London real estate. They want to park it in New York and Florida. Mm -hmm. They want to park it in offshore companies all over Europe, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in this investigation too, we the first story about mining focuses on a company that's listed on the London Alternative Exchange uh, that you know essentially offered a bribe to euphemistically called a success fee, quote unquote, mm -hmm. to a success company fee. connected to the evil. So we always want to show that this is not happening in isolation. This is uh, the world financial system is enabling this. And so much of the money that moves around the world comes from these places. It's really stolen from the poorest, some of the poorest, most vulnerable people in the world. Mm -hmm. and I think the only difference really between what's going on, for example, in Tajikistan or in Kazakhstan is the amount of wealth. I think the oil nations have far more money to basically mm. be stolen. And Tajikistan is poor itself, which I think makes the matters worse because you're already stealing from a poor country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Bruce, uh, let me, since we are talking about the uh, comparison kind of thing in the region, so there are a couple of other uh, countries, as you mentioned, as our colleagues mentioned, in Central Asia, where relatives of the president are active in business in many other aspects in the society. So Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan are obvious cases. How similar or different are they, the situation in Tajikistan when compared to these two neighbors? Well, I mean, uh, obviously, with the the children being involved, and yeah. uh, you know, um, then then you know, that's that is what compares well. Now, we can actually compare this with Turkmenistan really well. Mm. Tajikistan, you know, they got off to, to a bad start after independence, civil war, long, long porous border with Afghanistan, mountains from the east almost all the way to the west along the Afghan border. They were really, really having a hard time. It was obvious. It, it's kind of a strange paradox, but it was obvious they, they weren't going to be able to make it on their own. There was no way that they could do it. Rahman got in. He was Nobody knew who he was uh, when they put him in. He was put in by paramilitaries, essentially. Uh, you know, the country was a basket case in the 1990s, and Russia was the first one to realize that they weren't going to make it. Uh, without help, there was no possibility that Tajikistan would make it. But now, fast forwarding a little bit, the peace deal comes over, but the Taliban are still in Afghanistan, of course. Still a lot of concerns about uh, whether they're going to be able to hold their own or not. Uzbekistan, not very long border with Afghanistan, but a huge military by central relative to Central Asia, so that not too much of a concern. Turkmenistan, neutrality, they were able to cut a deal with the Taliban. They really weren't, weren't a big threat either. But Tajikistan was kind of a different thing. So Russia, of course, keeps his troops there, keeps sending money. Now 9-11 happens. The U.S. sees that, OK, this is, you know, all the Central Asian countries that border Afghanistan are, are probably someone that we should be uh, talking to and, and see if we can't cut some deals here so that we can use bases, transit routes and stuff through the country. So now the U.S. realizes that, OK, Tajikistan is a, is a is an important country in the region uh, because of its location. So we're going to help them out, too. And then, you know, more recently, um, China has also realized that that with militancy growing in Xinjiang province, that Afghanistan was a fertile place for some of the, the ethnic Uyghurs, potentially any way to go and get this kind of militant training and stuff. So Tajikistan, although it's not progressed very much economically, has become somehow too important to fail for a long time. <laughs> Uh, so the Rahman family has this weird carte blanche because no one wants to see the country go back to civil war. They don't want an unstable country on the doorstep of Afghanistan, which is also unstable. So he can do more than anybody else in Central Asia. He's been able to do what he wants and know that the international community will not abandon him because big players don't want to see this government go down uh, and seem to all be turning a blind eye to how he's running the country. It is 
it's so, that it's also... so depressing, Bruce, with yours. Yeah, that's the reality, obviously. Yeah, Elia, you want to say something Sorry. on that. Uh, but looking into this corrupt business connection of the presidential family in Tajikistan, what is the plan behind Sahibabu's success, expansion of his business, or it is just the corruption, or there is a bigger planning going on behind his expanding business? There's a bigger plan. I certainly don't know it, and I would think that he probably doesn't know it either. I mean, I think they're trying to make sure the regime will last, and that's the logic behind the repression. And the, as long as the regime lasts, they'll be able to hold on to the wealth that they're gaining, and they'll do that wherever they can. So I know it sounds pretty banal, but I really think it's just about amassing as much money as possible. And if we don't see their names yet in the Dubai leaks or somewhere, I'm sure someday they will appear in some offshore structures, because if they're smart, they will know that things can happen, and it's smart if you're a dictator or a dictator's son-in-law to find somewhere far away a tropical to stash your money. Mm. And I think really they don't have to worry about anything. I mean, there is such a culture of impunity and they're untouchable. So why not amuse the huge wealth? Because nobody's going to question you, really, mm -hmm. for any wrongdoing. Yeah, Bruce, I also want to take your point in this, like, is there any bigger planning behind his success or it's just a corrupt business? And also, Rahman might be uh, out soon, at least from active politics as a president. So what would that might mean to Sahibov kind of people? First, I should start out by saying that this guy was not tr not groomed to be a leader ever. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he didn't control the country for uh, really during the 1990s at all. It was yeah. people around him that were running the show. And, and, you know, I and other people at the time didn't think he would last. For what it's worth, he man has managed to consolidate his power pretty well. He's just not when you think of a leader. This isn't the guy I think of, you know, to tell you the truth. He's setting up his son, of course, to take over his place. I, everyone sees that. Which, it's very unfortunate. It's, it's, I think uh, what Ro Rustam Momali will be, is he going to be 30 this year or something? Or he turned 30 last year. I mean, he's barely old enough to even be president uh, constitutionally. But uh, in any case, he also has no real experience except for the little experience he's gotten from giving being put in charge of, of you know key government posts actually you know that would be the only time i think that that there might be a challenge to the leadership is it would be interesting to see what happens when there is a change if he puts his son up there uh, how the people react to that but as far as planning long term <laughs> i really don't think you know past dynasty and we've done this before on the show i don't think there really is a plan i you know no one can tell you i don't think in the tajik government what 10 years from now what what does Tajikistan look like? What what kind of plans do you have in place right now for development that will bear fruit in 10 years and produce, you know, something useful for the country so that it can keep going forward? I, I don't, you know, I don't see that kind of stuff happening out there. They do build a lot of things, you know, buildings, parks, things like that. And most of it's done with Chinese money or somebody else's money, yeah. uh, Saudi money lately. Yeah. But there is no there's no strategy. Uh, going forward, except keep the family in power and move on. And, and you know, I, I think it's really some of these family members of Rahman could be in for for an extremely unpleasant surprise in the future, because it's mm -hmm. it's a real question, like I said, about how the people are going to accept uh, having a, a leader to uh, potentially a leader who's in his early 30s with very, very little experience. And, and what people what the people in Tajikistan do know about him is, is not are not good things. Uh, you know, he, he's lived kind of a playboy life. Of course, his brother is his younger brother is out there. I think in the United Arab Emirates, he just posted a lot of stuff on his uh, oh. on his Instagram account a couple months ago. Show what a cars, fabulous yeah. life he had. Yeah. So, Elia, uh, during your investigation, given the Rahman might be out soon, and although he wants to remain in politics in this or the other way, as an advisory position or whatever, so assumption is that he is preparing his younger son Rustam to replace him. Uh, during your investigation, have you seen Rustam's name popping up in this or the other way? So just to understand, what is level of his involvement in this corrupt practice there? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I in our reporting, I. I don't think we really came across him that much. We really focused more on Sahiba than more on this uh, gold story. Mm -hmm. So if I had to guess, I would assume that, you know, behind the scenes, there are similar other schemes going on, but we can't speak to that. You know, we can just talk about what we found in our reporting. But I'm sure, you know, Tajikistan is not a country that gets that much attention, as I'm sure both of you know and we know. So I'm sure there's much more to find. And it's such a difficult country to report from that I'm sure even on the topic that we're covering, we didn't find everything. Yeah. Um, a question also of resources of you know our organization's resources and everybody's attention span 
I'm sure there's more to find, but we just don't know. Yeah, you, you know, you, if I you, could just jump in and say yeah. one thing too, he was the head of the customs service, and and there is nobody in Central Asia who is the head of the customs service who is clean. Oh, it's a plum job, and you get a lot of money that no that goes unreported from doing that job. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to conclude the discussion too. But the final couple of points here. You also mentioned that Ilya in your report and that Tajikistan, uh, you know, is not on the radar of uh, international community. So make your case why Tajikistan is important, why it should be important. Well, just from a human perspective, you know, these are millions of people who are living in one of the worst governments on earth. And as we describe in our story, so many of them have had, you know, sort of the ones who dare to stand up and to try to make a different future for their country. They're the ones who get cut down. You know, we had just to take one example off the top of my head out of so many, the exiled head of the IRPT party, Mujidin Kabiri, you know, he's in Europe now in exile. He was trying to see his father one last time. He was trying to get his father medical treatment in Turkey, I think. And his father, you know, was a 90 something year old man in a wheelchair and the security services took him off the plane just, you know, in his wheelchair and and forced him to make a statement essentially denouncing his son. And then he died and his, he never saw his father again. And so that's, you know, just one example that was sort of stood out for me. But this is real human lives and real human suffering. And I think we should always be attentive to that. More broadly, this is sort of, I think, Tajikistan is a good example of where Western countries that have sort of geopolitical interests choose to... Uh, prioritize those interests over human rights concerns. And this is something Kabiri also told me in our interview, that he sees the West as, at the same time, an inspiring in terms of the political traditions that he wishes had been in place in his country, you know, pluralism and democracy and so on. But at the same time, it's hypocritical because the West has dictators that they're happy to cozy up to uh, when it suits their interests. You know, if I was an activist, I don't really see myself as an activist, but if I was, I think I would use this case as sort of an example of um, trying to focus the attention of Western leadership more on democracy, more on human rights, and less on sort of short-term uh, geopolitical interests. And of course, with uh, you know President Trump's administration, there has been very little discussion of human rights as a priority at all. Um, so to the extent you know, I would say it's been, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, uh, uh. Miranda, the situation, the way it stands today, where is this leading Tajikistan to? Well, I think Tajikistan needs a re- reform. It, it needs mm. to open up access to information. I think it needs to provide conditions for independent journalism, for, you know, opposition, for, you know, it, it, those are the foundations of uh, better lives for people. If the business cannot operate freely and make money freely without being afraid that somebody is going to take it over, then the economy will stagnate because nobody's going to put in the effort. Uh, we've heard of examples of people who said, no, I don't want to expand my business because if I become too big or if I raise my profile, you know, they're going to just take it away from me. So people are not investing and they're not building the economy because they're afraid. I think there, there needs to be more attention from the West because in a way, our companies, the West is the one who is facilitating corruption and providing for corruption. And, you know, as long as you have foreign companies willing to pay bribes, you know, there will be demands for bribes in Tajikistan, because why not? Those are some of the things that need to be. Okay, Bruce, finally and briefly, your point, and then we will wrap up the discussion here. From day one, Tajikistan has been donor and later remittance dependent. There's a yeah. limited amount of wealth in that country, uh, yeah. which could benefit the people, and they're really going to need it. Its biggest importance on the world stage since independence so far is that yeah. it's in a place with, with horrible security problems all around it. When those security problems are resolved, and one of these days they will be, then uh, Tajikistan will be left with nothing but being in the corner yeah. in a mountainous region. It won't be on any major trade routes, uh, and there won't be much interest, and a lot of foreign money is going to dry up, and the money that there will presidential family is stealing from the country will be needed more than ever uh, and it won't be available it'll turn into if you think it's poor now uh, the chances are to be much poorer in the future well thank you thank you bruce panier the editor of radio for europe radio liberty central asia blog kishlak Owozi. for your insights and big thanks goes to Ilya lozowski the managing editor of the organized crime and corruption reporting project and miranda patrutsic the project is central asia editor Thank you very much for your time and thoughts today, colleagues. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. It was very nice to have you. And this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia podcast. Until next week, bye-bye.